Leon Cooperman, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, Pleasure to be before here. we get into uh, your sage investment advice, advice over the years, your thoughts that have been uh, proven out in the marketplace, the ultimate test. Everyone uh, knows about the letter you wrote to the president a few months ago. Uh, can you briefly describe what you said in that letter and what prompted you to do it? And I'm glad you're still with us today. Well, basically, <laughs> I only had one threatened, uh, threatening email, but most were supportive. Uh, what pushed me over the top, to be honest with you, was and I'm very inactive, uh, politically inactive. Um, when after the uh, very debilitating uh, budget, ex you know, deficit uh, limit uh, extension talks were completed, uh, and where they kind of ruined public psychology and scared everybody, rather than being you know Johnson-esque and all-inclusive and praising the various parties were coming together, for some inexplicable reason, he goes out and uh, he uses the podium to attack wealthy people, attack the energy industry, and attack private aviation. And the latter, the last one I thought was kind of humorous in the sense that, you know, um, one of the largest sources of exports in the country are uh, aircraft manufacturing. Those planes are made largely by union people, his constituency. His buddy, Warren Buffett, has an airplane which is called the, the indispensable. And uh, uh, what for? You know, why, why attack him as opposed to basically praising everybody for coming together? And, you know, he's been following, taking the country down a path that uh, I'm opposed to. You know, uh, I don't sit here bragging. I sit here blessed. I was a kid in the South Bronx. I went to public school in the Bronx, high school in the Bronx, college in the Bronx. I had a short stint at Columbia Business School, got an MBA that opened the door to Goldman Sachs. Uh, uh, and I went to the right firm at the right time. And then I retired from Goldman to start an investment partnership. And that was good timing. And so I've been blessed. And so, you know, uh, to villainize success, which has made the country great, I think, and create this environment of class, class war warfare is just totally counterproductive. If he simply, I never would have written a letter if he simply dialogued along the firing lines. We're in a difficult economic environment. All of us have to do more, particularly those who could afford to do more. I never would have written a letter. But being villainized uh, for having lived the American dream and then giving it all back at the end of the road, uh, I just see it's counterproductive. It's just wrong. And uh, I just can't seem to get through to him. And uh, I didn't hear from the president, but I'm not surprised. Uh, I did hear from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people all over the world, and uh, the message resonates with people. They're upset uh, the way they're being villainized for working hard and giving back. But it is we, what it is. Before we get to investments, uh, just to uh, amplify, what do you think makes the U.S. unique from other countries? What's special about that? The, the reward US? for individual initiative, the uh, fact that we don't, like in the UK, the one thing you could, I've always been impressed with, if you're, if you're a, a tailor, the odds are your father before you was a tailor, you're a tailor, and the father before him was a tailor. In America, you can make, you know, my dad, may rest in peace, was a plumber in the South Bronx. You know, I'm the first generation of my family to go to college. Uh, you know, uh, first generation born in America. And, you know, that didn't, that didn't stop me. I had a, a great education, uh, opportunity for an education, and I was able to make good of myself. Uh, you know, it's the old expression, you know, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach a man a fish, you treat him, free, free, him for a lifetime. And I think that it's just a different political philosophy, you know, and uh, it's, we're, at a trans we're, we're, at, we're at a crossroads in this country, in my opinion, you know, and it's not clear which direction we're going to head because, you know, 40% or so of the American populace is some type of public support, food stamps, whatever, um, and uh, they're probably in favor of the programs we're pursuing. The unions seem to be in favor of uh, his programs. Um, and so I think it's uh, not clear which direction we're heading, and I'd rather be less European-esque in our future and, and, and more a reward for individual initiative hard work, which is not to say we should not give others the opportunity. I, I'm all for that, but give them the opportunity and let them have a chance to make a better life for themselves. If I may, if I may after I wrote the letter to the President, I came across a quote. It's attributable to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there's some debate as to whether it is or it isn't, but the sentiments are perfect. They fit exactly what I was trying to say to the President. You cannot help the poor by destroying the rich. You cannot strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. You cannot bring about prosperity by discouraging thrift. You cannot lift the wage earner up by pulling the wage payer down. You cannot further the brotherhood of man by inciting class hatred, which I think the president has been doing. You cannot build character and courage by taking away people's initiative and independence. You cannot help people permanently by doing for them what they could and should do for themselves. And that's kind of my philosophy, and I would like to see the president uh, more embrace that philosophy, which is not to say we should not give opportunities to others. We should. That's what it's all about, create this opportunity for exceptionalism. Right. 
talking about government policies, uh, you're not a bond buyer. <laughs> I'm not a bond buyer, uh, and you can approach it in any number of ways. I mean, why would somebody want to buy an instrument that the government is artificially propping up? This is what, this is what it's QE2 and government policy is all about. Uh, so they're second, suppressing infra interest rates artificially. Uh, exactly. So you're buying an instrument that's being artificially inflated. Another argument, 10-year uh, government bond is less than 2%. You pay 35 or 40 percent away to Uncle Sam in taxes. You keep 60 percent, let's say, of two. You're getting 1.2 percent after tax. Uh, the inflation rate is probably two or three percent in the real world. So you're getting a negative return. Uh, um, and uh, historically, and we'll get back where history will mean something. Historically, the 10-year U.S. government bond has yielded in line with nominal GDP. Nominal GDP being the summation of inflation plus real growth. So if you say that we're in a world of two to three percent growth, which would not be high, would be less than historical, inflation of two to three percent, which I think is a reasonable expectation given our fiscal policies. That means nominal GDP is running somewhere in the range of four to six percent. So if I said to you, uh, in the two or three years' time, the 10-year government, which is being suppressed at less than two, gets to four to six percent, then my persuasion would be more rather than less in all honesty, basically. If you go from two to four or two to six, you have somewhere between a negative three to six percent per annum loss of uh, uh, capital. And I think the stock market, where you can find many good companies uh, trading at yields above, uh, well above the 10-year U.S. government bond, is a better way of trying to cope with inflation and keeping up. So Matt, I, I'm negative on bonds, yes. Uh, how, how long can this last? I mean, you could have made the same case two years ago. I think I did make it about a year ago, <laughs> to all honesty. Uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, I uh, uh, kind of fell into an expression that said, saying that stocks are the best house in the financial asset neighborhood. I was clear to say it wasn't clear whether the neighborhood was a good neighborhood or a bad neighborhood, but I thought it was the best uh, house in the neighborhood. Um, and I guess when the dollar starts to go, uh, um, or growth starts to accelerate, or inflation starts to accelerate, we'll see a change. And it may take a year or two, but I think people don't appreciate the risk they're taking in that instrument. There's just no cushion. If you're wrong, you'll never get out. You know, you get out in a common stock because ultimately the increase in cost that a company incurs is incorporated in their selling prices, so higher inflation lifts the nominal level of revenues and ultimately earnings. Whereas the only way the bond adjusts to higher inflation is to decline in price to keep the coupon current. And you know, in the old, not the old days, but in the past, if you had a six, seven, eight percent coupon, you had a cushion if you're wrong to, to get back. There's no cushion. You get, you're wrong in a bond today, you're going to spend a long time getting your money back. And get nothing for cash, so are stocks in effect the default position? Yeah, I mean, I understand. I, 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 yeah, I would say, look, the way I see it, Steve, people come to me not because I'm a brain surgeon, not because I'm an expert on real estate or oil and gas. They come to me because I know something about financial assets. So in the world of financial assets, what are my choices presently? It's cash, which is zero, and uh, Mr. Bernanke tells me it's going to be zero for a couple more years. It's U.S. government bonds. Well, we've kind of touched on them already, that 2% is just the wrong number. Third, I'll give you a statistic, not to sound like a statistician, uh, high yield an area that we did quite well in my firm in 2010 and 2011. Uh, the Bloomberg High Yield Index was 25% in November of 08. That index today is 7.3%. So it's down by two thirds. In November of 08, the S&P index was 900. The earnings on the index was $65. So the S&P was trading at 13.9 times earnings when the yield in the Bloomberg High Yield Index was 25%. Okay, the uh, index today, S&P index, is uh, trading roughly at 1370. Earnings are a bit over $100 in the index, so we're a little bit over 13 times earnings, down from 13.9, and the high yield index has dropped in yield by over 70%. So uh, I don't think high yield represents a particularly attractive area as a generalization. There may be one or two or three or four names individually you know and you like you could buy. So, so e th even though the easy pickings are uh, gone on the high yield side, uh, REITs, I guess, as well. Um, you still f you think, though, that stocks even yielding well, 2 or 3% uh, uh, are better than 7%? As a generalization, uh, this is the way I, I look at it. For the last 50 years, the S&P 500 multiple averaged about 15 times. It's currently 13 times, so two PE points below the long-term average. When the S&P multiple averaged 15 for the last 50 years, the 10-year U.S. government bond in that 50-year period averaged 6.67%, currently two. So it's less than a third. 
and yet multiples are lower. So the stock investors have the wisdom or lack thereof of saying either interest rates are going up, uh, that they're now already discounting, or the world is going to grow more slowly. Personally, I think it's a combination of the two. But we're back to a condition which n hasn't existed since 1958. My professor at Columbia Business School told me when I was in business school in 1965 and 66, said that 1958 was a very famous year in the equity market. That was the year of the yield reversal. That was the first year where stocks began to yield less than bonds because investors began to buy into the concept total return. The total return of stock is a function of the current dividend plus the growth in the dividend. And we're back now, you can find many, many companies selling a, on a yield basis less than the, uh, more than the yield on bonds. And they have a growth component. So yeah, I would say, look, every asset class is being subsidized by the Fed today. You know, I recognize that, we all have to recognize that. But I think stocks are less subsidized uh, than other asset classes. So what stocks do you like? I mean, you've been Apple at one point. Uh, uh, yeah, AIG. well, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, like it, it, yeah, it's hard, you know, when something is up so much to, to recommend it. But yeah, we, uh, we like, uh, I wrote down a list of stocks anticipating you'd ask that question. So uh, basically, um, a whole potpourri in technology. We do like Apple in this le recent correction. We think it's a good opportunity. We like Qual Qualcomm in the semiconductor area, Google, Citrix in technology. Uh, we think energy is a long-term issue still in energy. So with Halliburton, uh, Kinder Morgan, uh, uh, the MLP, uh, Transocean, the uh, ultra deep water drilling company, uh, Lin Energy and MLP. Uh, we like a bunch of financials. Frankly, I think the banks, uh, uh, JP Morgan, Citi, Sally May, Broadridge Financial, KKR Financial. It's a whole potpourri of names. Each one has their own story. I have you know, about eight analysts that work with me. Uh, their job is to propose, my job is to dispose. And we find no shortage of stocks. Uh, uh, Sirius Satellite uh, Radio, uh, Echo Star and the- uh, Why Satellite Radio? They're gaining uh, market share and uh, automobile sales are picking up and uh, a goodly percentage of these new sales of autos are using satellite radio. And, uh, Do they renew? Or yes, yeah, very high renewal rate, and uh, everyone I've run into, I, I'm not a user because I don't drive very much, I don't spend much time in the car, everyone I know that has it uh, is happy with it. They generate about $700 million a year of free cash flow, paying down debt, and now you may have a little excitement because Mr. Malone, Dr. Malone wants to find a way of increasing his ownership to majority ownership, and maybe some good things can come out of that. But uh, lots of things that we're finding. Healthcare, uh, the HMOs, WellPoint, United, uh, we like a turnaround, Boston Scientific, but you know each story has Pharmas. its own little. Pharmaceuticals? Uh, we don't have any involvement at the present time uh, in the major pharma companies, but uh, I'm, I'm sure on a total return basis that a Pfizer or something like that could be interesting. We're not involved. So uh, in terms of equities this year, even now you think, you think President Obama's going to get reelected? Well, no. Uh, I don't want to look for any trouble, but I hope not, but basically I'm a Romney supporter, though I'm not a really an activist uh, uh, in a political right. sense. I, 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 we started the year thinking the market could get to around 1425 to 1450 in the S&P. That was our target. Recently we were 1419, so to sit here and say I'm a raging bull would be an incorrect portrayal of my view. I think stocks are the best house in the financial asset neighborhood. As a citizen, I'm nervous whether that's a good neighborhood or a bad neighborhood. I think one of the things we're lacking in this country is political leadership, political courage. I don't blame the president completely on this because frankly he's inherited a, a Congress that has no room for moderates. Uh, we got uh, you know, radicals on both sides and he's just not been able to bring them together. But I would say uh, the market is moderately undervalued, not greatly undervalued. I think there are three things that would get the market up uh, uh, more than I'm thinking this year. Uh, one, if there was a significant reacceleration of economic growth. I think right now we're probably dipping down to about 2% growth path. If we got an acceleration of two and a half to three, that would be very salutary for the market. I think secondly, if the political outcome looked to be different than the consensus, you know, in trade uh, polls, 60%. have 60%, President Obama, um, if it starts to look like there's more of a horse race here, uh, and by some luck, it, uh, Romney gets control of the executive branch and Congress, the stock market will go up dramatically. Then I think we have a setback next year, but I think no matter who's elected, we have to deal with the problems. We have not dealt with the problems. We're kicking the can down the road. And the third wild card uh, that I see, which is I, I think a plus in a sense, is most investors have de-risked. 
know, if you look at pension plans, they're 47% equities, the lowest since 1998, down from 60. They're not going to make their actuarial assumptions on 2% uh, government bond. Right. And the public has been selling uh, equities and buying bonds for the last five or six years. So if we have any sense of uh, a better, uh, uh, more optimism about the longer term outlook, we could see a reflow out of fixed income into equities, which would be very positively uh, greeted by the stock market. So I, I would, but I'd say the, the near-term issues would be reacceleration of growth, which is probably not going to happen for a while, a change in the expectations for political outcome, and a change in risk preference by either pension plans or individuals, which I, it'll probably take some time. So you're going against the grain. You're in equities. I'm going against the grain, but I'm prepared to be patient. Let me give you a little statistic. Uh, I got my MBA on January 31st of 1967. I had no money, I had a six-month-old child, was now a money manager, age 45, and basically, uh, maybe he's closer to 46, I don't want to misgets my own kid's age. Um, and uh, when I joined Goldman, the Dow Jones average was 1,000. And 15 years later, it was 1,000. Now, I did reasonably well picking things that were less than 1,000, and uh, I, it may be that we're in store for several more years uh, uh, where the market doesn't do a lot. I tend to look more at the S&P. The S&P was 1527 in March of 2000, it was 1565 in October of 2007, and it's currently around 1370. And so it may be that it takes a few more years for the delevering process to take hold before we build a firm foundation to move ahead. And the area that we haven't talked about, which I think is a big risk, big risk which could change psychology in the near term if something improved, is what's going on in Europe. I mean, it's a real basket case. I mean, they're clearly going to be in a recession, and there's a great deal of consternation of what's going on there. So I think another thing that could be an impetus to the market in the near term is if the uh, conditions in Europe were less severe, less adverse than we're anticipating. So uh, on, on, on that, everyone likes to think they're a long-term investor. They like to think they're a disciplined investor, and they are until the market goes down or the market stagnates. You're actually putting money to work and telling uh, you and your... Uh, your clients well, may I, take uh, four years, six I, years, but you're going to do fine. I've, yeah, seen, I would this, say, I've uh, seen this movie before. In two, in two, in, in uh, I think two days I'll be 69, April 25th. Uh, I am a long-term investor. Uh, I got a little bit of everything. I, uh, I've been very fortunate and having done well. So uh, if you would have told me 25 years ago in my career that I would be sitting on a decent amount of cash earning zero, I'd say you're crazy. I never would do it. But I have that. I have a lot of high yield bonds. I have a lot of equities. Uh, the world's uncertain. I think you need a certain amount of diversification uh, 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 because we don't know what the outcome is. So but you're still holding your high yield bonds? We've reduced it from 40% to maybe 10% of the okay. portfolio. Um, we're about 80% net long. We don't have a lot of shorts. We think the market is reasonably priced. Um, and I do believe that if you had a three to five year look, equities are far superior to the returns you're going to earn in fixed income. Far superior. Quickly on uh, reforms, you have ideas about uptick rule, high frequency well, trading. Uh, uh, basically, it, it, it was done with a sense of uh, tongue in cheek. But um, about uh, six months ago, I had a conference call with my investors. I have a general. You, you have a platform. I had a platform. You're, you're uh, ahead of both parties. Now, given my age, I don't want to tax my memory, and I want to be justice to my platform. And I really believe in this platform. So I told my investors towards the end of the conference call that I was thinking of retiring from Omega to run for president. <laughs> uh, I, I've come to you for advice, but you, you forget, forget about it. Get that out of your system. Uh, the, but, the key is win folks. Yeah, but, uh, right. <laughs> but basically, and I said this was my platform. Number one was get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. We've done one of those. Provide every returning soldier with a free four-year college education or trade school of their choice. These are valiant young men. They deserve our complete support. Set up, second was set up a peacetime WPA effort to channel a portion of the savings into rebuilding the U.S. infrastructure. Third, unleash the domestic energy industry to develop domestic energy supplies and reserves. This will create employment and also reduce our dependency upon foreign suppliers. Fourth, government spending should be limited to a growth rate at least 1% below the level of nominal GDP to get the government's role in the economy down. Uh, freeze entitlements and raise the Social Security retirement age to 70, with the exception of those that work at hard labor. That's not me and you. Uh, a 10% income tax surcharge, which I hate, but you've got to we got to show that we're willing to sacrifice. 10% income tax surcharge for three years and those that earn over 500000 a year. Uh, seven, I don't like taxes, but I propose a 5% VAT tax uh, to get at the underground economy and deal with the deficit. There is simply not enough money in the hands of wealthy people They'd to deal with it. never keep it at five. I know. Well, the only, country, <laughs> the only country in the world that went the other way after putting it in was Canada, yeah. where they did reduce it. 
But uh, I, I think that the numbers are so large, you can't get enough money out of the wealthy people. You know, I just filed my tax return. It creates the impression I don't pay taxes. My effective tax rate was 28.7 percent. You know, I, uh, my plea is the Republicans and Democrats should get together and decide what is the appropriate max and tax rate on wealthy people. Okay, take that number if they can agree. 17%? Well, I, I, I'd vote for you, okay? <laughs> I, I wouldn't expect that, but I'd vote for you. I wouldn't expect 17%. I like 999, he's no longer running. But basically, take that, t that number. That will tell you approximately your revenue yield and size the government to that revenue yield. This notion of running trillion dollar deficits ad infinitum is crazy. We're just heading down the path to Greece. It's just a question of how long it takes you to get there. So going on my platform, uh, t tackle health care in a serious way. And last was the first one you mentioned, which is I think that they've change the stock market, they, they turn the stock market into a casino. The um, uptick rule being eliminated has given rise to all these high frequency traders. This trading and credit default swap should be limited to those that own the underlying bonds. You know, uh, I, I, it's not in anybody's interest to have the stock market casino. I recently had lunch with the head of the New York Stock Exchange. He said 70% of the daily trading today has nothing to do with fundamental investing. It's high frequency traders and the slicing and dicing of ETFs. It's not constructive long term. It's no wonder why the public has left the market. They're scared by this volatility. So uh, this is my view. Now, Mary Shapiro knows it. Shapiro knows it. For some reason, they don't want to reinstate it. You know, they put the uptick rule in initially to deal with the abuses coming out of the 30s. Yep. And, you know, uh, uh, it's enough information to see. There's no rational reason for the market to have the kind of swings it's been having. So, Impressive platform. Have you convinced your wife? Tell, tell us, and we'll let you go. Tell us the, what your your phrase about your wife. She she. No, no well, my her. wife. Uh, God bless her. We're married 47 years. In August, we'll be 48 years. We met in our sophomore year in college, and I said on TV once that uh, you could be a socialist if you're married to a capitalist, which along the lines, I guess, Margaret Thatcher <laughs> says, you know, being a socialist is good till you run out of somebody else's money or something along those lines. <laughs> no, I have a good wife and a good marriage, but my you know my wife and I have voted the same way. I think once in 47 years of marriage. Well, that's a testament to true love. Lynn, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.